Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll be continuing my series on academic writing tips. And today, precisely, I'll be talking about how to incorporate secondary sources or articles published about your topic by other authors. How do you incorporate those in your discussion? Uh, now, please keep in mind that there are extensive resources available on academic writing in my academic writing and publishing playlist. So this kind of supplements that. But here is the scenario in which you are incorporating other people's writing about the same novel or the same text, right? So you've already decided your thesis, you've explained your thesis, you've laid out your theory, you've explained your theory. And now at some point in your paper, you must also account for what others have written or published about this text, right? And it can be directly related to your thesis or it can be tangential to it. But the way to incorporate is by giving a signal phrase, you know, before I go into my discussion of the novel, I would write, like to um, discuss what others have said about it. And then you take each essay, either thematically organized or chronologically, and then you start with Masood Raja in a 1996 essay suggests this. You give the crux of it, add a citation, and then give a discussion, a brief discussion of what your views are on that. And then also a brief hint of how you're building up on that, right? Then you go on to the next citation and do the same thing. Three, four, five, six people, depending on the length of your paper, are enough. These are the people who have had some opinions about the topic or about the text that you're writing about. And you are doing a couple of things. First of all, you're showing your readers and reviewers that you have read other people, right? Two, then you're making your work referential to that work. You're saying, I am building up on this thing that they missed, or I'm reframing their argument in a different way from a different context, right? So what these secondary sources do is they ground your discussion. They show the reader and a potential reviewer that you've done your research and you are entering a conversation. You didn't just sit down and say, you know, I'm going to write an essay about how Jane Eyre is a feminist now, right? Assuming that, you know, in about 150 years, other people might have assumed that too and written about it, right? What you are claiming is a certain degree of knowledge through your research about a body of work that might exist about the text that you're writing about. Now, a question often arises, what if there is nothing published about an article, a text that you want to write about? So let me give you an example. About 12 years ago, when I was going to publish an article on Kuratal and Haider's River of Fire, especially the translation, there was only half an article that was published in the West in English in Annual of Urdu Studies. Now, there is immense writing on the novel in Urdu as well as in Hindi, but not in English. So the way I situated my essay then was as an essay that launches this discussion and makes this into a point. Why is it that not a lot of Western scholars have either read, taught, or written about River of Fire, even though it is probably the greatest novel in Urdu language. Part of it is because it got translated too late, but also it's too complex, right? So if there is nothing about the text you are writing about, then you can also say, you know, what is it, the general opinion about novels from that region? How have other authors viewed novels that might have been published in the same region or deal with the same kind of issues? And then 
plot your own discussion in reference to that. So keep in mind, the purpose of secondary sources is not to find something that says exactly the same thing that you are planning to say. The first and foremost purpose is to write informed scholarship. And that informed scholarship will depend on your awareness of how other people have tackled with that text, right? So that's one purpose of secondary sources in your paper. The other purpose, of course, is you as a scholar declaring that you are entering a conversation and that you are aware of the conversation. And the third and more important to your thesis and your paper is you arguing that here is a body of knowledge available about this text. Here is how my paper is unique because I'm doing something different. That something different needs those references to posit itself as different, as innovative, or as something that expands on what was discussed previously. These are the reasons that you are using the secondary sources in your paper, right? You're not just using them to say the same thing that you want to say, right? That's kind of, we do it in undergraduate studies, but beyond that. So keep that in mind. So roughly, let me just repeat, after you've define your thesis after you've laid out your theory, briefly introduce your te primary text. You then go into five, six, seven, eight articles that you have read carefully and that you can glean what their main argument is. You kind of explain that and point out if they missed something or is there something you are building upon or responding to and then that becomes an integral part of your paper. I hope this is useful to you. Um, I will post a link to one of my own essays. It's probably not my best work, but a lot of my graduate students found it useful. And you can see where I cite the secondary sources, how I'm doing almost the same thing that I just talked to you about. So that's it. I hope this is useful to you. Let me know what you think. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, support my efforts, support this channel. Uh, your words, your comments, your questions are always encouraging and are always welcome. Thank you so much. I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, from me to you, peace and love.